Welcome everybody to uh, this uh, installment of our uh, Delta on the Move lecture series here at the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences uh, at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, I'm Gassan Moazin, an assistant professor uh, here at the Institute. And um, as is already in the name of the lecture series, this lecture series is part of um, a new project we have here uh, at the Institute, Delta on the Move, uh, that looks at the historical development uh, of the Greater Bay Area uh, since around 1700. Um, and uh, I'm also today joined uh, by the, our lead researcher uh, on this project, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, John Wong, who is with us here um, today as well. And this lecture series is basically a way of, of bringing together um, uh, scholars uh, and, having, and looking at the work of scholars that uh, work broadly um, um, uh, on themes connected to uh, this uh, project. And uh, today we are very happy and honored uh, to um, uh, welcome uh, to the lecture series uh, Professor Shang Fei uh, from uh, Sun Yat-sen University in Guangzhou. Um, Professor Fei was uh, trained uh, or received his PhD both from uh, Beida, from Peking University, and uh, uh, the Australian National University. And he works generally on uh, overseas Chinese history uh, and environmental history. Uh, and we're looking very forward very much uh, to, to uh, learning more about that today. The title of his talk today uh, is uh, Pearl River Delta Migration and the Changing Resource Frontier uh, in the Australasia uh, Colonies. Now, before I move, or before I hand over things rather uh, uh, to Professor Fei, I um, should say a few words about the format today. So Professor Fei is going to talk for around um, 45 minutes probably uh, to a bit under an hour, roughly. And then we will have some time uh, for questions and answers. Um, as always with our uh, talks, uh, we are using the webinar format. Uh, so if you have any questions for uh, Professor Faye that you would like to ask, um, please submit them through the Q&A button uh, in Zoom. Uh, and I will then uh, read them out in the Q&A uh, time that we have. And uh, Professor Faye can then uh, I'll get back to you and 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 answer the the questions for everyone. Um, but I uh, would not want to waste uh, uh, any more time, uh, and I would then like to um, hand things over to Professor Faye. So, uh, Professor Faye, if you're ready, um, please uh, feel free to start. Yeah, thank you very much. I will I will share my screen first. Wait a moment. Yeah. Okay. So is everyone can see the, my point point? Yeah, thank you very yes, much. Very good, yeah. Thank you, Professor Wong. Thank you, Hassan. I'm very pleased and be honored to be invited here today to share my, you know, some kind of superficial studies. I, 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 would ne I will never dare to say uh, my research is very mature, but it's only some of my thinkings about uh, my studies over the past several years. And it's also, uh, I have to, uh, say it's also a, a co-organized uh, and prepared by my friend and also a scholar from New Zealand, James Beatty, and he contributed a lot of materials from New Zealand for my studies too. We share a lot of things. And also, uh, I would like to thank uh, Professor um, Mabel Chen. Uh, she introduced me to this great institute uh, to share to international audience. It's my first time since the last year I have an international a global international lecture. And uh, I'm still a little bit worried and nervous, but I think gradually I, will, I can do a lot of things that may, uh, may cause your attention. Um, today, my topic will be like a per river delta migration and the changing resources frontier in the Australasia colonies. I would like to briefly uh, introduce my thinkings and uh, the cases I can show how the per river delta migration change the world. During the past several years or decades, we have found lots, lots of mountains of books and studies working on how the international factors, the, uh, the missionaries, all those things change the modern Chinese history. But today I would like to find a topic is about how China, you know, utilized, sees and utilize the colonial network to influence the world. And so, so my, my topic will come, my contents will be will be a consist of three parts. First is I would like to introduce the, my thinkings from Cook Exchange to the Cantonese Pacific. It's a framework. 
Then I would like to use the first case is about the gold rush, how the gold rushes around Pacific Rim opening resource frontiers to the Chinese migration. And the third, how the Chinese migration, especially the laborers and the entrepreneurs, they make, they engage in market gardening, plantation and uh, factories, especially dairy factories to, to uh, transfer the Chinese experience and thinkings and skills in making a new world. In a long time, we, we get a theory about the Columbia Exchange. It's described the world changed after the Columbia voyage since uh, late 16th century. And it's mainly a, a, a cross Atlantic exchange. It's not simply social, economic or political or military issue, but also very important thing about ecological exchanges. But the other scholars argue that Captain James Cook also, do, also did the same thing, that it connected the South Pacific especially and all the whole Western part of the North American even to the Eurasia continent and the, the so-called old uh, continent. So my topic is, uh, 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 my, topic, uh, my cases today is happens with this background. It's not simply about the Chinese who living the other part, but we also focus about how Chinese can be engaged in such a, a great part of the world. Okay, it, so it's also include uh, the ecological exchange too. I will show that the Chinese skills, the native experiences and ideologies and technologies change the local environment and the landscape. So this gave me a lot of, you know, uh, hints. Then also the, the place I discussed today, the, the area you can find, it's mainly focused about the Southeast Asia, uh, Southeast Australia and the New Zealand. So this part is uh, where the stories happens. And I think a very uh, great uh, contribution about the Canadian scholar Henry Wu. He, he says that since the 19th century, uh, since the, at least the 19th century, there is a Cantonese Pacific origin is in shaping. And uh, as, as Ren Tucker Jones also observed, from the 19th century to the 1910s, Chinese, China's demand and Europe's desire to meet it transformed the Pacific into the world ladder by expanding Chinese environmental footprint from Southeast Asia into the wide Pacific. So we focus about, the, when we talk about Chinese migration, overseas migration, we have to focus about, we have to uh, notice that mo men of the, uh, the most part of the Chinese migration, they spread around the Pacific, not Europe, not Africa. They, they do have a lot of Chinese that, at that time, but mainly they spread to Pacific Rim and the Indian part and the Indian Ocean, and uh, and the uh, great scholar Elizabeth Singh is Elizabeth Singh also find the Pacific across in his in her book, it's it's reminded across the Pacific from uh, east to west, but it's also remind me of thinking about how these people you know the Pacific Rim not just a, a dimension of west to east or east to west, but also north south way, so. I would like to uh, go further to show how this connection happens. Okay, the first important thing is the sea cucumber or the trepans. This trade connected the South China, not necessarily the Pearl River Delta, but the whole South China, mainly including Fujian province and Guangdong. They connected to the Indonesia uh, uh, hunt of uh, trepan or trepan business. It's a very significant way. It's a very significant thing that uh, the northern part of Australia was connected to the South China. So these, you, you see the, the book show the, I borrowed the map from the book and it shows the, the voice, the route from how the North uh, Australia, you know, connected to China firstly. And uh, we find that these parts is more like a, a resource frontier of trepans because of the, uh, northern part, uh, the trepan resources is 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 uh, extinct, it, it extinct. So the southern part, especially the Australian one, became very important. Uh, in late uh, 18th century and the early 19th century, our study shows uh, almost one quarter of the Chinese imported trepans come from the south, 
South Pacific that mainly come from uh, Australia and the uh, islands and uh, like Vanuatu, like uh, Solomon Islands. So Makassar, Makassar is also a significant port. So ex expanded, you see from this picture, you see the trepans distribution in the world. The map shows how the trepans distributed. You find the uh, from Southeast Asia to the north part of the Australia is very, uh, you know, a great uh, food for trepan hunt. So this void, these routes connected us. Uh, Australian to China, and it's also Australian's material like Captain Flinders also show the Australian notice that Chinese are, are uh, compelled the Southeast Asia and especially Indonesia local people to to going on uh, to go to win on a, a trepan fish, and uh, it's also caused uh, not simply the resource uh, uh, depletes of trepan, but also the trees. You know, the trepan have to be dry very quickly then it can be can be transported so uh, transported so the, this picture shows how how the northern part of australia the wood the wood was cutting down and burns to dry the trepans then the second way to connect the the void the, the route or connection is sandalwood from fiji to marcus islands to hawaii to new hebride today's vanuatu the sandalwood a market or resource frontier also contributed to the to the creation of the Chinese and the northern part of Australia and the, and the Pacific Islands because of the, uh, the 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 reduce of the Fiji sandalwood. Then the other part became more important. So it's it's the step is is not a surprise because because our you know uh, exhaust of the resources is step by step. The third important thing is the sea furs. The fur seal hunting is a significant part of the Chinese market to get the, the furs from all over the world. And a southern part of the a southern southern field of the, the sea furs is became significantly important in early 19th century. And Guangzhou is became a, a center for this business. In 1788 to 1833, there were 6 million to 23, uh, 6.23 million pieces of seafarers from the South Hemisphere flow to Canton and London, by which two thirds were finally observed by Canton. And in those parts, two thirds also come from the South Pacific. And so the, the seals became commercially uh, extinct since, uh, since, 19, uh, since 1830s. And the uh, this trade creates the new voyage, the new, the new routes from Australia and New Zealand directly to the Chinese market and to the Pearl River Delta. So it's paved the way that Chinese migration, you know, in the following years come to Australia and New Zealand so smooth and so quickly. So, but there is still a question how those place became a, a, such an ideal aim of the Chinese migration. You know, we find that the thing happens in mid 19th century, it's Pacific Gold Rush. That attracted the Pearl River migration, you know, initi initially move around the world. We find that it's not simply an independent case, just like in uh, simply in California, but also in Australia's Victoria, in New Zealand, South Island, in Queensland, in Queensland, in Western Australia, and in Alaska. So except Alaska, all these uh, gold rushes I showed here engaged, uh, there are Chinese, there were Chinese engaging. So you, you see it's, it's a great part of the global uh, Chinese di diaspora. It's a cause for why so many Chinese uh, per, from Pearl River Delta, you know, spread around the different corners in the Pacific. So we see these part is uh, where Australia found gold. And also it became the early, you know, uh, communities that absorbed a lot of Chinese uh, gold miners. Most of gold miners, they are bankrupted uh, per river delta farmers. Uh, 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 not, I would not say the pen, 
they they are not farmers but the peasants and it, it it's in it because of the gold rush happens in a hinterland of australia so the environment there it can be very rough and tough so chinese from pearl river delta you know show their very you know strong mind and ability to live in i will show more detailedly later and it's also showed that the same thing happens in new zealand although the south although the southern uh, the south islands gold rush the mating otago and western coast and the western uh, coastline is these parts the, the environment is also rough so it's it's a it's a, a very challenging work but very attractive and the people you know uh live live there in 20 years after 1850 so during the gold rush in 1850s to 1870s mainly the cantonese my my means come from the pearl river delta miners were a significant part of the international migration and with dramatically changed the abroad with uh, change the original landscape and ecology particularly the local water system flora fauna soil and a settler society the communities buildings by their unique skills and equipment i will show a very broadly a very typical landscape about the gold rush you see from aboriginal landscape of australia the, i see kate but now today she's also a uh, in the audience, I, I think she's more, you know, uh, professional in these things to know this. The Australian find that the landscape was dramatically changed during the gold rush. And you see the wood was cut down and the older original uh, landscape was, uh, became a very marginalized and the new things happens like the tents, you see the tents, but all the things in the mess. So during this transformation, China, Chinese uh, Chinese miners contributes a lot. But those parts, in many cases, in many areas, is lack of water. So sometimes the so significant thing is not whether there there are gold or not. There were gold or not, but whether there uh, there were water. I found a very interesting case. There was a widely used the so-called California pump in Australia and New Zealand. It's a motor. It shows it's a motor widely used. It can be a lot of uh, other additions, but the, the original one should be like this, or, or, or sometimes like this. So it's what's called the California pump in Australia. It, it largely resolved the, 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 the lack of water problem. And also in New Zealand, and also in you know, many parts of the world, many parts of the world, including Alaska. Alaska, you see this, California pump were widely used, even in Alaska. So we all think it's, a Austria, it's an American invasion, California pump, but with the studies and the, the you know, archeologists to help, with the help of archeologists, you know, in California, we find the wooden paddle chain pump was widely recognized as a Chinese invention. It was named California in Australia and New Zealand because it was introduced from California to Australia and New Zealand. So it's a very typical uh, technology transfer around the world, around the Pacific Rim. It's a very Chinese, you know, Pearl River Delta, not, simple, not, not necessarily limited in Pearl River Delta, but very typical equipment using an irrigation system in Pearl River Delta. When the gold miners go to California, they transplant this part to California. Then it was widely used and accepted by all miners, including the other Chinese miners. Then they moved to Australia and New Zealand too. And these facilitate the activities of gold rush to washing gold. Today, even today, you can see there is a there are you know parks in China in the Pearl River Delta. It shows to the smart kid that there is you know wood chain paddles. So we can find the Chinese, you know, skills, you know, you know, integrated into the local so-called new inventions. But more than that, if that's just a, a small case. The second case I can directly find from the material that I can show is the use of long term. The long term is a name, nickname 
from California miners. It's like a, some kind of bed, you know, put mood bed that you put the dirt into the bed and with water stir it and wash it. Then you get gold. So it can be widely used in some, you know, place that without a lot of people, but, uh, you know, sometimes remote from the water resources. But the Chinese in, Calif- in Victoria, Australia, they connected the long terms, long terms to a lot, we, we call it the sluicing mining. They introduced the water into the, to the sluice box tank. I think then they use the water to wash the dirt. Then from high position to the lower position, you gradually, easily, you can pick up, uh, pick up the gold grains. So that's also, why, uh, that's also a Chinese uh, invention. And we can find it with this change. We also find some, you know, it, this is a picture painting from, uh, found from the Beach Wars local archives. You can find the, these Cantonese miners, they use a very, you know, local people have very unique equipment to lift water from the water hose from a lower part to the to an upper level. Uh, you have to mention this, this uh, unique equipment. This unique equipment is made from bamboo. Bamboo in Australian's tradition from both originals using or the, the European settlers society, bamboo is a wheat. It's not a, a it's not a use for tools, but the Cantonese, they use they, they, they connected the bamboo sticks into a long into a long stick and a tube to get water. And uh, uh, I I checked the material where they get to the uh, the bamboos. Uh, they are not necessarily originally from. Uh, they are not necessarily get from the local goat food, but also they borrowed uh, they imported from China. It's not widely used, I have to say, compared to the, the wood, chain, uh, wood chain pump, but it's also uh, quickly and uh, very high efficiently, effectively resolve the water uh, supply problems. So you can see during the gold rush, you know, the, the how we can make the activity more smooth and quickly. The Chinese skills and the smart technology skills using is really helpful. But more than that, I would like to say, not simply we destroy some landscape, we also you know, construct the environment, the new ecology and environment. I will, the first case I would like to use and main uh, stories I would like to share is market gardening. It's, there were several books discuss about the, the things of bittersweet soil to, to the Australian, New Zealand, the Chinese market gardening. A lot of books focus about that. But I would like to argue that it's really important to, from a rebuild of the new ecology, to think about the contribution of the Chinese miners. After the gold rushes, they widely used the the the, the pieces of small pieces of the land that mainly useless, um, very, very without any fertilizers. You know how they make this land the, the, with the tailings, with the with the rap, with rubbishes. How they make the land to be a fertilized for agriculture. So the first thing is, it's by naturally a cause of the need of fresh nutrition. Very few European miners were skillful in horticulture at that time. So the Chinese, because they mainly came from the Pearl River Delta villages, they of the they of comparatively speaking, comparatively speaking, they are more familiar with the agriculture things. And second, they, they also liked it because of the so-called the cultural transition. They want to get the self-sustainable food menus. So they plant uh, vegetables from China and they gradually found it's a great market because most miners, they need it, the fresh vegetables. Although they can get f- food like, like wheat, or like rice from or by, in, by imported businessmen, but the fresh Vegetables is very hard to get directly. So when they built the hot, when they built a new, you know, market the gardens for ve- vegetable plantings, they built the environment. They plant, they plant the, uh, the, the the land. They 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 knock the stones, the the soils into small 
uh, pieces and they, they and they, they fertilize the the land the, the soil by you know we call it the green fertilizer like the the, the ferment uh, uh, leaves and plants and also the manure and the urine so it's a great contribution to improve the local landscape we see it's a picture shows how the victoria in the hinterland without the with a few very, very few people but the chinese occupied a small part of the the abandoned land the how they built the the new, the land to be our market gardens market gardens the, this picture large picture is like this and these smaller ones is not that time it's almost 20 years ago it's already a, a, a garden a picture in a suburb area of sydney but it shows that in, during the 30, almost more than 30 years or 40 years after the gold rush, the Chinese is sustain their activities and, they act, uh, and their works in market gardening scenes. So this, uh, we, we can easily find a lot of you know, pictures and paintings and photos to show how the Chinese uh, became a hawker and they also, they also became a small storekeepers. They selling the vegetables from their own field or from their uh, neighbors. So it's, it's become a very typical image of the Chinese in late 19th century. So these things that really, you know, uh, in, in Australia, in the gold field especially, I think it's very important because I argue that this place is a, 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 in a frontier area. You know, the, the logistic issues can be very severe and problematic. And the Chinese contribution of veg fresh vegetables and fruits are very important, valuable. And uh, later, it comes the rise of the Cantonese cooperation. We always focus about in the in the older in the in our older studies we research we always focus about the the merchant class of Chinese. We all the, the earliest overseas Chinese in Australia and the New Zealand history will focus about the merchant families. And then later, we also find the miners of China from the diggers from the Pearl River Delta. They always describe it as a very weak, you know, uh, easily to be separate, easily to be heard, and very weak and very weak uh, class. But I think they, they are not necessarily the 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 uh, very simple picture. It can be more com complicated. Some of the Chinese they get rich during their works in Australia, even with the, with the pressure from the white, white Australia you know, policies, but they still became gradually very uh, activities in combining different technology and learning different knowledges and, uh, and accumulate their money. I'd like to show the cases is about the Cantonese miners' investments. Uh, sorry for that. Yeah. Yeah. They use both hydraulic mining and the dredgings from uh, in the gold field on the gold field. Hydraulic mining is widely seen in California, uh, Australia, and New Zealand. Um, but in late 19th century, it's became less profitable because the the poor mines uh, are still using the the richest mines already exhausted. So. The white businessmen always abandoned this field, so this left the, some space for the Chinese uh, investment. But the dredging things is a, a new invention, especially in New Zealand, where they, where you can find more water. So it's systematically changed the water, local water system, and the soils. You see how this works is compared to the former gold rushes. This industrialization of the Mining produ productions or uh, producings, it can be seen. It's widely, you know, change the local uh, landscape, especially they make the collapse of the topsoil. Then they can find the 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 grain, uh, the the gold grains from the tails. You see, this also shows in Victor in some part of the Victoria. It's early 20th century uh, pictures. It shows about how these miners use a hydraulic pump to, you know, to destroy the local, you know, uh, mining dirt to get gold. 
And uh, this picture, you know, a very interesting. It's 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 a hydraulic mining company. It's it was uh, cre it was uh, created by a Canton a, a Cantonese. His name is Chou Su Hui. We call it Xu Jing Pei, the Chinese name. And this picture is shows there were three figures in this picture. It's from the left to right. It's a it's a it's a Chinese labor. Uh, it's a it's a it's a British it's a British it's a British uh, miner. And this is uh, Xu Jing Pei. And this is also a Chinese labor. So if you find the Chinese company. Cantonese company at that time is not simply a, a pure Chinese corporation or something. It's widely, you know, high the uh, the, the European uh, migrate immigrants too. Uh, it's also uh, absorb the money from the local community, not necessarily from the Chinese community. So it's give us a very vivid picture about how these Chinese merchants and businessmen integrated to the local society and also change the local environment. Otago, even today you visit Otago, you'll find it's not a typical landscape in our impression on New Zealand. It's some, it's some kind of a wide and uh, you know very desert part. And the dredging things also from this uh, same figure, his company used uh, the Chinese uh, money and the American European technology should build the dredging things to get get gold and uh, uh, soils from the bank. You see this a dredging picture, the picture of dredging. It's it still existed. The model is still existed and you can find the uh, the efficiency of the of the uh, machine. It's it's just a very fit to the very shallow, you know, water levels and get a lot of gold. So after the mining things, especially to the poor mines, I think very important thing we have to notice is about the plantations in Australia. Uh, there were so there were some already several studies on banana plantations, but I think these issues should be to get should be. Uh, more it should be studied more deeply and uh, specifically because in late 19th century queensland is still a place that because of its uh, climate tropical tropical climate it was seen a place without a white man with or white men are not fit to live in this part but it's already a part of british empire and australia so how we use this place and how we can make this land be fertilized is a, a very big question, challenge to the uh, settler societies. So it's, it's greatly, uh, the, the place was changed by a gold rush in Palmer River in 1817s. And uh, more importantly is the Chinese miners in, not simply engage in this Queensland gold rush, but they settled down to develop agriculture and uh, plantation issues. And in this, in this Queensland field, the businessmen in, in Sydney and in Melbourne, they developed uh, an, an industry chain of investment, plant and selling together. Banana plantation became a very a pillar to support this chain. So, you find the part man of the where the banana plantations happen is mainly in not in the far north in Australia. It's a part of it can be very hot and humid places to the European settlers where they're they're native they're, where where they native in Europe. Uh, it's cooler and it's it's more flat. But in this one, it can be very woody, humid, humid and uh, hot. But it's very interesting as it's my personal thinking is the Pearl River Delta's people, they um, compared to the Europeans, they are more fit to these climates. I live in Guangzhou. I'm not born, I was not born in Guangzhou, but I live in Guangzhou and uh, I travel several times to Southeast Asia. I find this place is uh, more similar to South Asia, Southeast Asia's climate, but not to the Northern part of China. So Pearl River Delta's Chinese men, they, 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 they prove they are, very you know competitive labors and uh, 
you know, workers in Southeast Asia, also they can be the similar, uh, they can also play the similar roles in North uh, Queensland. So they, they, so they, after they play, uh, the, they destroyed uh, the deforestation, things happens here, they became the first uh, uh, farmers and uh, builders of the local small towns and uh, plantations and agricultures. This picture shows the Gerard, Geraldton. It, the, to, nowadays, the name is Innis Fell. The picture shows how the Chinese banana plantations already uh, constructed or built like this way. You, they, they even use the, I estimated they even use the, you know, the train or the modern transportation equipment to move their, uh, pl their fruits. And a banana was widely uh, sell, was widely sold to uh, Melbourne, to Sydney, and other parts of the of the Australian and New Zealand cities. And uh, some of them are even sent to uh, China. And the, after the Queensland banana plant uh, plantations, they also expanded the plantations to Fiji. And Fiji became a, uh, in early 20th century became a, also a great part of the Chinese banana plantations and uh, it shows how their it shows how their uh, Chinese uh, workers they, they transport the bananas from the hinterland from hinterland the banana plantations uh, to the to the port of the uh, Queensland then move this and transport these bananas to southern parts of Australia and New Zealand so we can find it in these archive from the from the Queensland local archives. There was there were more than I expected materials. I, I can we can see that how the Chinese from the Pearl River Delta deeply engaging local you know uh, plantations and uh, many sc scholars even 30 or 40 years ago they all they already you know use material to prove that uh, in late in the end of 19th century and early 20th century. You know, uh, in Sydney and Melbourne, you know, two thirds at least of the banana sailor, sailors and the market was occupied by the Chinese businessmen. So it became a system that developed into a, 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 a very amazing, what I will call it, it's amazing corporation. Uh, you find that there was a company selling the fruits at first, then and gradually to many other uh, items and uh, and uh, uh, goods they call the Wing Sun. Wing Sun is uh, is a, a it's a cooperated companies by several significant Chinese merchants from Hung San. Today is a Xiangshan, uh, Zhongshan Shi. These families, they, I think a lot of people have heard of the families. You know, the Ma family, the Guo family, and uh, you know Li family and. Uh, Cho family, the four families they integrated their, you know, works and their uh, fruit plantations into a big start, big stars to selling bananas and other things. This picture in shows the the founding of the of this uh, company, and uh, you find that gradually they also have they built their own uh, departments of stars in different. Uh, part in China, you know, uh, as, as far as I know, they get the money, they built the, they built the uh, Wing Sun uh, company, but they also get the, uh, the thinking from the uh, Vict Queen, Queen Victoria building in Sydney. They want to, they want to uh, copy this in Hong, first in Hong Kong, then in uh, Guangzhou and Shanghai. So these four, Department stars was originally, I can say, originally came from the Queensland banana plantation. These four department stars are so influential and widely uh, uh, widely noticed in modern Chinese history studies. But I find very few scholars really noticed these these department stars from Australia and uh, from a very tropical corner in Australia originally. These four, Sincere, Wing On, Samsung, 
there are some these four departments is uh, 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 how do you say I, I was so surprised when I when when I first time to to notice these four companies is is connected to such a, 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 a remote corner in the Pacific and also it changed the Chinese modern you know uh, business history a lot especially in the urban area so you find the the interaction, uh, the in interaction between Australia, and New Zealand, and China through the business network, but the behind the network, it's uh, widely and systematically and specifically accurately using of the local environment and ecology, ecological resources. And uh, we also find a lot of materials shows, except the building uh, banana plantations. The Chinese also, you know, uh, work a lot on pedal wood, pedal field in Queensland to green rice. So uh, there were lots of stories like that. And uh, the other branch of the story happens in New Zealand. It's a, sometimes a similar, but not that famous stories, but I would like to say something more about New Zealand. Sometimes we are so, New Zealand is even more, you know, uh, even more small, uh, is smaller and uh, even more unnoticed uh, compared to Australia. But I think it's also a very significant part of the story because New Zealand is part of Australian colonies in that time. And second, New Zealand is uh, in the cultural history, they say New Zealand, it was told uh, it's a more pure white society. Australia have some you know, people assert that there were a lot of, you know, uh, dark histories, but New Zealand scholars sometimes say, except to, to the Maoris, the white people in, the so-called white people, I would say, it's European settlers, there uh, can be more pure society. How this uh, society, you know, also, you know, uh, welcome and, and absorb the Chinese uh, immigrants to be part of that society. This case, uh, it's, uh, already find is we call it the Chiu Chong. The name is Zhou Xiang. His his name uh, he was recognized as the king of the fungus and the dairies. He is he was born in Guangzhou and moved into Australia, then to New Zealand for gold rush in eighteen sixteens. Then he moved to the North Island to the North Island. Uh, in 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 New Zealand, so he he worked in a very a hilly and mountain forest place. It's a, you see this New Zealand, and he live in the corner here. New Zealand, this part is can be warmer, and this part became became very cold here. So this part is a very you know in the middle, but uh, with very a lot of very den densified forests. So he lived almost here, almost here. He walked in this place to collect the 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 uh, the material, uh, the 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 material, the irons and the the, the coppers and the sometimes the gold, uh, the tailings to 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 sell them to China and get money or to the local people. He's not a, a, a originally engaged in any agriculture things, but by accidentally when he walked in the mountains he find the wood the wood uh, they have a lot of fungus the fungus he is come from china he noticed that these fungus we call the wood ear muar so this was very important part so he found this rarely used and eat by local people but it can be very very important to the to the chinese market so he so he hire the local Maoris and the white uh, laborers to collect the wood ear. It's because it's very popular and prized in Chinese cuisine and medicine. So he returned to Guangzhou and uh, secure a market for this product and the living instructions and money with the local stockkeepers to purchase, to purchase as much as possible as the fungi. Over the next decades, fungus export generated significant revenues for 
for him and uh, others involved in the industry. From 1880 to 1920, New Zealand fungus exported, exports totaled 400 and 401,000 pounds. It's by Hong Kong, I, I find the statistic, statistic shows 90% of the exportation from New Zealand to China, you know, was consist of fungi. So it depends on the network about his local business network and the some part of, uh, of the guy, of the figure I mentioned uh, before is Xu Jinpei, Chou Xu. And uh, also it depends on the Sydney's businessman. And uh, very importantly, it's also, it depends on the Cantonese sailors. So it's became a very strong network in the late 19th century, 20th century. They find new resource frontiers in New Zealand that can fulfill the Chinese market need. I do believe the Chinese market, it, it, they, they absorb the goods all over the world and the New Zealand contribution is just a small partial, but to New Zealand, it's very important part of the connection to China. And for, going further, uh, Chou Chung find the local area is a great place to build, to, to build dairy factories because New Zealand's milk is so good and the local technology is so bad. So he find the local dairy factories, okay? They make the money from the business, business network from Chinese. And also he find it's important to borrow the to borrow the uh, techniques from the European U European uh, businessmen to build the new factories for dairy for dairy food, and uh, Chou Chung helped transform the industrial uh, to transform and industrialize this part South Taranaki the name landscape, and with building these new factories and uh, the also export the butter. The, the name is Jubilee. Jubilee, you know, the name is, is, is especially, to, uh, you know, uh, attractive to the, to the lobbies and to the fans of British empire. So it's the market, the end market, uh, the potential market is not China, it's uh, Britain. And in the late 19th century, the frozen ship transportation has been on the way rising. So it quickly, the Cho Chung quickly sit, sees and uses this opportunity to export the butter to Britain. And uh, quickly, the new, it's, it's in, from the records of the New Zealand dairy history, he is one of the earliest, you know, uh, large fa factory makers for, to, to produce butter for, for exportation. So it's a, when the, this business growing in concert with the developing transportation networks and the growing global demands. He also uh, promotes the technological innovations in, to build the high quality butter. And uh, this factory cost 3,700 pounds to build and equip the, to, to cooler the, the producing lines. And it boosted, and it's boasted the latest imported technology and the own in invention. He he bore he he bought two Danish cream separators, processed 150 gallons of milk an hour. And also he's creation a new you know institutions that he shared the, the contributor of the milk to local small family farmers. You know, it's a modern, it, it's a model that still used today that the dairy factory never depends on a very single supporter of milk, but a, a large area, you know, small part of the milking, factory, milking farms. So Chong is a very typical and smart uh, Chinese businessman that can, you know, learn and, uh, you know, upgrade the technology and the knowledge about this. Uh, industrial scenes.
But the consequences is, I have to say the consequences is the severe deforestation in the area. Today, this part, you know, uh, is not, not necessarily a very woody area. It still have a lot of woods, but it's not that densely woody area any, anymore because of the, you have to destroy the, uh, the forest to, to grow grass, to, to make dairy farms. So it also promotes a massive grass plantings. So in this local economy, Chu Chung, you know, became a significant economic, economic contributor to local economy. And he was also, you know, highly respected by local community uh, and get a lot of, you know, rewards. He also, you know, get us two or three, you know, stars, you know, that uh, ret retailing stars, you know, uh, facilitate the local economy. And his son, you know, finally sold the, the, the stars because it's uh, to his, to his uh, son, it, 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 these book stars, and it's not necessarily important anymore because the factory is also, is already very important, very popular. So that's a lot of things that I can uh, briefly show today. I, I, I think I can leave, I can use these questions to, uh, to people and to get more stories. To, I just briefly show what I'm thinking and I talk today is uh, several conclusions. The first, the first thing I'd like to say, this case, showed how Chinese land was tightly connected to a remote corner of the earth by migration who move across the ocean. I think it's very important, the, uh, the cases I use today, is the China in the modern history is never isolated or separated from the outside world. Even from the government or central government perspective, it's a little bit isolated, but the, from the local area, from the people angle, it's not, and it never be a very passive way. It can be a very passive way. So the second thing is Chinese sees and use the modern global colonial system and network to spread their knowledge and influence to the, on the outside world, positive. Third, I would like to say, if we want to get more understanding about the Chinese, we are not simply focused about how Chinese living in abroad, uh, they work, live as a Chinese. No, I would like to say they became localized. The localized not simply became a, a genetically or culturally became a, a, a so-called European style, but I think it's it's a combination and uh, you know incorporation about different cultures and techn technologies. They are not that uh, inner uh, part. They they also very open to the outside world. So so we we from an environmental angle or ecological uh, change angle, we can find there influence on the outside world also, also have like a coin have two sides. You know, they can be sometimes destru destructive, but also constructive. That's um, all the modern history or overseas migration history happens in a new place. Uh, okay, I think I have to stop. And uh, many thanks for, for, list for your listening. Okay. Is it okay? Um, yes, yes. Uh, yes, Professor Fei, thank you so much for giving us such a wonderful uh, talk and such a wonderful overview um, of your work. Um, as I uh, mentioned before we started uh, the talk, um, we now have some time uh, for questions and answers. Yeah. Um, so as I mentioned before, if you have any questions uh, for Professor Fei, please uh, submit them through the uh, Q&A button in Zoom and then I will read them. Uh, out uh, and uh, Professor Fay can reply. Um, so we actually already have quite uh, a few questions. Um, uh, we have a few questions from Professor Angela Learn, who, which I will try and uh, take together. So um, she first asks, um, how Cantonese, uh, quote unquote, the technology that some of the technologies you mentioned, like pumps and pipes, um, were that were um, that were used and, and how Cantonese were the vegetables that were grown. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think somewhat together with that goes um, from what part particularly, uh, uh, specifically in Guangdong, uh, these miners came. Um, uh, and 
then uh, sort of a second uh, part of the question uh, or second question that uh, she poses is um, for the last case you talked about in terms of the milk industry, um, uh, whether there was any kind of competition from the Europeans and uh, how well the Chinese did in competing uh, with them. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, from the uh, simple questions I, I'll answer first is, um, these Chinese I mentioned today, mainly from Pearl River Delta is Gaoman, we call it Jiangmen, we Gaoman from the Cantonese pronunciation, I think. Uh, and also from Zhongshan and the Dongguan, we call it the Siyap and the Three Yap, these parts. Not from any parts of, as far as I know, not from the, from the Chaoshan, no, no, not, not, not part of from Chaoshan area, I mean, uh, and, uh, they are they are you know uh, very strictly limited that time in in the four counties in uh, nearby Per River Delta, we and uh, the milk dairy factory yet yeah, very few competitions because that time the New Zealand part uh, in in this part is still very limited development economy and the lo local area because it's very. Uh, deeply, uh, very intensive, uh, intensively woody. So, uh, and because of a lot of Maoris, they they have Maori wars with the uh, with the uh, uh, white uh, settlers sometimes, and it's caused the local uh, economy in a very bad situation. So, the very few white uh, or settler society would like to invest in such a place. And the Cho Chon is very lucky. He he graduate he he found the fungus in this place and accumulate money finish his capital accumulations. Then he, you know, in the local area, he directly investigate the milk, the, the dairy factory. So it's become uh, comparatively easy for him to avoid the competition, uh, to, to compare, uh, to avoid the severe competition from the white, uh, from the other, you know, European society or European capitalists. Uh, the first question, how Cantonese was the technology and uh, the vegetables grown? You means, uh, I I I'm not really understand the questions mean. What what do you how Cantonese was technology, and the vegetable grown? Uh, sorry for that. My English, my English is very. <laughs> how Cantonese was a technology, pump pipes, etc., and the vegetable grows. I mean, I suppose how how specific were these technologies and the veg I mean, you mentioned that these were. Mm -hmm. Chinese, I suppose, but how specific they were to Canton? Oh, the Cantonese, yeah. If I understand the correct. Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yes, yeah. I have to say that we have in, in my studies. I am almost I'm always thinking about things. That time, the overseas societies always, you know, learn or know the Chinese through the image of Cantonese. So to me, as a non-Cantonese, I'm not a Cantonese. So I think that time the Cantonese represent a lot part of the, how exactly specific Chinese, the, the, the uh, immigrant or settler society can reach. So these technology, I will not say they are necessarily limited and unique or exclusively a Cantonese innovation, but because that time these people, they are all come from Guangdong. So these technologies can be recognized or considered as a, as a Cantonese invention or things. And the more important thing is uh, Guangzhou, Guangdong's uh, in climate and environment is more you know, convenient and uh, easier for these people to develop the, the irrigation you know, technology. Their technology is, is sometimes different with the northern part. Northern part irrigation system in China can be very different with the uh, Cantonese ones. The land is always small pieces of land and the, some part in the northern part can be large pieces of land using. So the technology using can be different. So that's what I can briefly uh, in answer. Yeah, like that. Okay, any, or there were further questions? Yeah, there are further questions. Um, yeah. So we have another question from uh, Professor uh, Mei Boqing. Yeah. Um, and she says, uh, many thanks for Professor Fei's presentation and asks, uh, did the Cantonese migrants' transformation of Australasia yeah. uh, landscape yeah. come into conflict with the conventions oh. and interests of the indigenous people? Oh, oh it's very, it's very great question. It's very important question too, yeah. Because we, 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 we train, when we know that, uh, you know, we, we study the English writings about this part of history, the new continent history, we always think about the original 
relationships with the, with the settler societies. But in Australia and New Zealand, the case can be uh, easier because before the Chinese massive Chinese migration happens in Australia and New Zealand, the original society already, all the, all the original community already almost destroyed and, and spelled out by the, by the earlier uh, European settlers. So the Chinese met some problems. They do met, did met some problems with the indigenous people, but mainly in Queensland, because Queensland is very, you know, uh, uh, late, uh, very was developed, uh, was uh, exploited by the European settlers lately. So there are still indigenous society. They have a conflict. They, there are some records even show the Aboriginal Australian they eat. Uh, the, far, the, 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 the outsiders, including Chinese. So there were, there were some problems, but it's not a big, big picture. It's only, you know, in some specific areas, not, all, not a full picture of the, of the thing. So, so I think it's uh, 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 not a big question about the, the specific context in Australia and, uh, and New Zealand. And the Maoris that time already get a compromise with us settler society in late in the end of 19th century so they basically are still are also friendly to chinese yeah most of the chinese pressure came from the you know european settler societies when they get so influential the the white australia or white new white new zealand policies uh, you know uh, boomed so that's a so that's a, a, a bigger challenge to the chinese community yeah yeah all right Any great uh, thank you um, yes, we do. Uh, we have another yeah. other question coming from uh, Christopher Sapla. Um, and he says, thanks for this great talk. Uh, I'm interested in the connection uh, between the earlier part of the discussion about trade and the later portions about Chinese migration. Uh, did trade links that ultimately tied Northern Australia to China prior to the initial colonization of Australia and New Zealand lead to increased interest and migration to Australia and New Zealand compared to uh, North America? Okay, the, the link on the mention, I will read it. The yeah, link there's an attorney in Australia trying to turn prior to the mission. Okay, a very good question. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I, you know, when I, when I, you know, study stars of this topic, I'm always wondering how the Chinese suddenly, you know, can find Australia such a place that even not that familiar to their European societies, how the Chinese can easily find it. I, I, I chased the, the, the marine route from Australia and New Zealand to China. Then I find the, the, the trade of uh, sandalwood, trepong, and uh, seafirs are so important. And uh, yes, I would like to say, uh, I can, I, I, it's a question about whether Chinese established the connection to the North, to the North Australia is earlier than, you know, the, the Europeans connected to Australia. It's very hard to, Get a very uh, to get a strict or accurate judge, but a northern part of Australia at that time was not a core of the Australia colony to the British. So uh, when the Chinese uh, they found the trepans came from northern Australia, no Chinese, I mean individually, they really know where the northern Australia is. You know the connection is not that direct. The case to the trepang trade. So the Chinese is high, uh, is, is uh, higher the, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia, especially the Indonesian people to hunt the trepangs and collect them. And uh, they, get, they receive the goods in, in Makassar and in, later in Singapore. So, so this part, we, 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 I would like to say the Chinese, I will not agree that Chinese so-called established the connection earlier than other things. And, uh, to North American, I think it's North American is earlier. The connection to China should be earlier, should be earlier. And, and also we could, should not forget the Russia. They, they also contributed first from the hinterland of the Eurasia continent. So there were many routes, you know, contribute the same goods from all, all the corners around the Pacific Rim. And uh, uh, New Zealand and Australian one is just a place that, you know, uh, you, not that usually mentioned. But I, I would like to say it's also a, important. Yeah, it's not really a, a who is earlier or who is later thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, that's my okay, question. Thank yeah. you. Uh, that's my answer. Yeah. Um, we have another question um, yeah. from Sandy McDonald. 
Yeah. So uh, she asks, uh, is there information around how or what motivated businessmen uh, who set up in Sydney uh, in the 1850s? Uh, also, uh, were there records kept about uh, who these were and how can this information be located? Okay, information around how or what to motivate the businessman who said, yeah, uh, there were several case studies about uh, uh, Mei Kuang Ta, these scholars, I think uh, some, some of the audience today, they are also uh, experts on these issues. There were already many cases on that. The, yes, they, there is information. And we, we in, in uh, investigation and the visit in 2016, we find that some Chinese uh, CYUP uh, society, they still kept the records about the thing, the information about that time to, to the businessmen that and how they organize it. And it's even to a, a underground society's network. You know, after the Taiping rebellions, uh, things they, they also they also find a lot of you know uh, underground connection and the information distribution system. So you can find them. You can find them. Never, and the, they exactly have a lot of cases. Oh, sorry for for the question. Later question. Uh, all right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think Helen Shepard has a, sort of a um, just a question of whether you consider. I mean, Amoy or Xiamen is, I think, not normally considered part of the... Uh, Amoy, Amoy is not a part of Per River Delta, I think, sure. yeah. yeah. Um, all right. Uh, are there any other questions? Uh, please uh, submit them uh, uh, in the, um, the Q&A, uh, through the Q&A button. Um, there's another question from Professor Leung. Yeah. Um, and she asks, do you have a rough idea of the rise and fall of Chinese economic activities in this part of the world? Uh, sorry, for, uh, for, uh, would you miss... Uh, Slowly? Yeah, sorry. What, what's the question? Uh, she asks, uh, do you uh -huh. have a rough idea uh, uh -huh. of the rise and fall of Chinese economic activities uh -huh. uh, in this part of the world? Uh -huh. uh, when was the peak of their success? Okay, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Did the Chinese lose their influence here uh, and why? Okay, yeah. I would like to say uh, it's very deeply, uh, his it's very deeply connected to the situation, the whole Chinese community faced in late 19th century in Australia and New Zealand. Because the rise of the, you know, uh, white resist, re res racial attitude, you know, expel Chinese or, or marginalize the Chinese community and even later forbidden the Chinese migration since late, uh, since 80, uh, since 18, late 1880s, that it's strongly attacked the local Chinese a cat, a, a economy as a whole. So the peak, as far as I know, it should be uh, in, in 1880s as a whole. But some big family, you know, Chinese businessman's family, they survive, they are not simply survive, but because they are very, get, very early, you know, Australianized or New Zealandized, I mean, integrated into local society and get a lot of res social resources and keep a very, strong and the smooth connection to the upper level, uh, to the upper society of the settler society. So they survived and uh, became super big uh, businessman's family. But in, uh, after the Australia became a commonwealth after 1901, the whole continent became a very you know, conservative and uh, racist uh, uh, country, that uh, state that expelled the Chinese uh, so the families in Australia, they, 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 when even they get rich money, they, they do not always invest in Australia. They get the money invested in Shanghai, in Hong Kong, and other parts. So uh, the big family, they live, many, many of the members, they enjoy their very rich lives in Australia, but their, their money, the investment is not limited. Uh, they, they, are, they are not mainly focused in Australia and New Zealand anymore. So, so I, I, I think that uh, to the whole community of Chinese economy in Australia and New Zealand, it's getting, it's became declined in the last 20 years uh, in, uh, in, of 19th century. But, but the, the, the individually, the businessman's influence became declined after uh, 19, uh, of one, it, I mean, after the 
Commonwealth when the Commonwealth was built. And in the, the, the most bad situation happens in 1930s, uh, before the Second World War, because of the Australia and New Zealand forbidden the Chinese uh, immigrants. So the older Chinese societies decline, shrink, no, no, no new, no younger generations. You know, I mean, it's always native born Chinese second generation, but not always the, the, the first generation of Chinese migration almost stopped that time. So the, the whole community and the business uh, became very, very bad in, before the Second World War. Yeah, that's a, that's a, uh, yeah, that's a worst situation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah thank you. Yeah. I know we're uh, quickly running out of time and we've kept you here for a while. Um, a great presentation. And the, uh, the part that really intrigues me is uh, when you talk about the technologies, many of them are water related. So there's a huge hydraulic component to the technologies that you are mentioning. And I wonder how that relates to, uh, in a material dimension, um, to uh, some of the, some, some, some of the, elements that these Chinese uh, migrants might have brought over to Australia or, or why they might have chosen not to. Uh, the, the bit that is uh, intriguing to me is that you said the bamboos remained imported into Australia. That's not something that grows, um, well, that's something that grows relatively easily in different parts of the world. Is that an ec ecological issue that they could not grow bamboos there? Yeah, uh, the very interesting and important questions. You know, uh, first I will say that the in the, earth, the 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 very Chinese skill and technologies using in gold field is always happens in eighteen uh, sixties, eighteen fifties, and eighteen sixties and eighteen seventies. There were so that time both Chinese uh, miners and the European miners they are not. A, they are not well equipped. They are not well equipped. So the we call the two banfa, the native experiences from their homeland can be very useful. So the Chinese use the, the tours, you know, especially in some small uh, cases, uh, in, in some individual specific cases, they use it. But I will, I I, I cannot say it's widely used. Firstly, they, I, I can only prove they have they had it, but I cannot improve it's widely used or accepted. So. So I have to say that the, the most of the Chinese technologies I showed in the, on the gold rush time is not that you know, sustainable in the, in the later years, because in the later years, the machines, the modern machines is, is, is so popular and widely used, like hydraulic mining. It's not uh, referred to any Chinese experience too. And the bamboos problem is, in Australians uh, in ecology that is very unique in the world. They do not have a, they do not have a really you know, complicated ecological system. So bamboo in many parts of Australia do, did, did not, uh, does not exist. In the, in the northern part it exists, but in the southern part of Australia, bamboo is not a native species. So it's, and it's because the hinterland is comparatively very dry and the, 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 the temperature shift every day dramatically. So it's not good for planting bamboos. And I found the Chinese use bamboos because they use bamboos like levels. When they carry the carriages, when they carry the carriages, when they carry the bags, they use bamboo pipes for tours. Then they find the, the tour that the bamboo pines can be connected into some way useful. So it cannot plant it, and no records show they did plant it in Australia. And the, I think it's also because it's a the the you the 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 place that use this bamboo equipment is not that widely existed, so it's no need to to be, uh, to plant bamboos. But it's but it's still but this case is to me it's fair enough to show the Chinese can use their you know native experiences in a, such a, a strange new land to them, and they get survived by these things on the gold field. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, let's see. Um, we have one more comment from uh, Professor Mei Wuqing. And she says, my speculation, uh, the Chinese travel to North America also brought, uh, that, that travel to North America um, also brought bamboos over voyage for many purposes, mm -hmm. uh, including for building uh, um, bamboo 
Babu Theaters uh, in California. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Chinese travel to North America also brought bamboos over the voyage for many purposes. Yes, yes. Uh, in North California's case, it's, it's much easier to, to study more materials and uh, the, the, the population of the Chinese community can be larger and uh, uh, the, 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 the development of the California is quicker. But in Australia, I, I only find uh, yeah, very few, you know, really bamboos was using as constructive materials they use as some small or simple tools but I, I never find any you know uh, building was made by bamboo or something and uh, I, I I will not say it's a uh, uh, maybe it I do believe it maybe happens in California but not necessarily in, in Australia I have, uh, the the thing I have to argue is in California the, the climate and the environment is, much similar with the hinterland of Australia, but in but the Sydney and the Melbourne, these coastal city, these coastal cities, uh, they are very different. They they are more like uh, uh, some European cities, uh, Western uh, European city, harbor cities, but not the California, you know, uh, uh, cities. I, I think that's also a different thing. So, I mean, mainly the states, the whole colonies, the situ the climates can be similar, but the specific. Uh, cities, their, their, their environment and landscape can be different. We have to, when we study the specific cases, we have to very carefully to, 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 to notice that. Yeah. yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Um, unless there are uh, any uh, further questions, um, and because we've already kept you uh, so very long, yeah, um, that's okay. I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, uh, what remains what remains for me to do is um, to thank you very much once again for giving us such a wonderful overview and such a fascinating talk. And also for so patiently um, uh, answering uh, all our questions. Um, and we certainly look forward um, uh, to learning more about your research uh, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, before um, I end uh, 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 the talk, I should uh, mention that um, the next uh, lecture in the uh, Delta on the World lecture series will take place on the 4th of November. Uh, when we will have uh, Professor Xin Hang uh, from um, Brandeis University, uh, who will talk about his research on Chinese overseas communities in uh, Vietnam. So uh, please uh, keep an eye out on for that. We will, of course, um, uh, advertise this as usual through uh, our email list and through social media and on our website. Uh, so um, uh, you have that to look forward to. Uh, but once once again, thank you very much to Professor Fei and thank you to thank all, you. Of, all of you for tuning thank in. You for and, uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank and I hope much. to see many of you uh, at our uh, future talks. So yeah. thank you very much. Thank you. you thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. All right. See All right. you. Yeah. Bye-bye.